It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today. Uh, uh, it's Carrie Lynn Alex, who is a fisheries biologist with the Okanagan Nation Alliance Fisheries Department. Carrie Lynn's major area of study is river restoration in regards to salmon spawning and egg in incubation habitat through the guidance from traditional ecological knowledge. Carrie Lynn is also the steering committee chair for the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative, a large project partnership that follows an ecosystem-based approach for the benefit of indigenous, aquatic, and terrestrial species. It involves relocating dikes, lengthening channels, re-establishing meanders and pool riffle sequences, reconnecting rivers to floodplains, replanting riparian vegetation, and includes long-term monitoring. We're looking forward to learning more about monitoring the ORRI projects from Carrie Lynn today. And it, it's, it's really my pleasure uh, to be here in the session with, with Carrie. Uh, my connection with her goes way back to our days uh, at BCIT. So Carrie, uh, welcome and we'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, those were good days. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, monitoring methods, some of the results we've seen, and adaptive management. Because the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative has uh, occurred over the last uh, 20 years. So there's been some interesting learnings that we've uh, been able to incorporate and move forward with. First slide. So Casey gave a great overview of the Okanagan Valley. So I am located on the Silks traditional territory, unceded, uh, in, of the Okanagan Samokameen. And the valley ha is very narrow. It has high elevation uh, wetlands and then steep canyons, and then it comes down into a very narrow valley. And that's where all the streams, tributaries, and rivers exist. And it's also where all the people are. So we have a lot of urban river uh, issues and encroachment that uh, has occurred over uh, over the years. Next slide. And a number of these issues related to concepts around flood management. So areas, all of the lakes have been dammed. Uh, they are natural lakes and they still function as natural lakes with some, uh, but very modified, very regulated controlled flows. And in conjunction with that, there was a high amount of channelization of this, this system. So this all occurred in the, in the 1950s. The dams started in 1912, was the Okanagan Dam, the first Okanagan uh, Dam uh, at the outlet of the lake. McIntyre Dam went in in 1915, and Skaha Dam wasn't until 1950s. But they were all upgraded in the 1950s along with this uh, channelization and these drop structures that you can kind of see in the in the bottom photo. And this made a massive impact to uh, the river ecosystems that exist for the Okanagan River. Next slide. And what it does is it has pretty much destroyed the, the river ecosystems. Again, as sort of Casey has sort of uh, alluded to a lot of uh, da the damming has really changed how sediment has moved through the system how connected it is to the uh, floodplains. Uh, this was a space that was very uh, heavily covered by wetland spaces, ephemeral floodplain spaces uh, that is now pretty much lost. So 84% of the river has been channelized, which means three kilometers only is left. Several years ago, we did an economic analysis of what that three kilometers represented, and it was millions of dollars between carbon sequestering, uh, support for the salmon populations, which we only really see salmon, uh, we see a lot of salmon primarily spawning in these, this three kilometer reach. In this three kilometer reach, we in any given year might count, even in the heat of the summer, about 150 rainbow trout. Whereas in the semi-natural section, which is only another two kilometers, there'd be 75 trout. So it's almost always half of what we see in the natural section. And in the channelized section, we see zero. So a very stark monitoring indication that we have a big problem and a lot of it relates to channelization. And then how do we go about fixing that as an initiative? So not only have we lost um, uh, quite a bit of the river, but uh, due to channelization, but the length has also been uh, 
uh, reduced so that now we have a very straightened channel. So we don't have all the meanders. So we've lost the, the total amount of area that a fish could utilize. 90% of the riparian vegetation has been lost. Again, to the Dyke Maintenance Act, you can't really, all of these spaces that have been channelized have also been diked and you can't plant on the insides of the dikes unless you have a really fabulous um, dike manager that will turn the other cheek every so once in a while, which is very beneficial to us all. Um, In-stream diversity has been pretty much been dug out by an excavator in the 1950s and is really struggling to um, reestablish itself. So once what was pools, riffles, islands, gravel bars, um, is now a straight, deep glide with very little gravel um, uh, spaces for uh, spawners or even rearing fish. The connectivity to the floodplain has been lost in this entire channelized section, this, except for that three kilometer natural section. And as you probably can imagine, native fish, uh, indigenous fish species have declined. Uh, exotic fish species, though, have done amazingly well, which just adds to the issue that we have related to um, protecting indigenous fish species, um, which are particularly salmonids for us. Next slide. So the Okanagan River went from this very highly torturously meandering space with uh, connected floodplains, wetlands, to the bottom picture, which is a very straight shot. And a lot of this um, relates to not the science of the time, but the objectives of the time. The objectives at, was really a land grab to try and create these spaces that were flooding annually into um, economically viable uh, farms. Um, well, now it's wineries, but to be uh, fruit farms um, and ground crops. And, uh, and to, to control this flooding, which occurs pretty much the width of this very, very narrow valley. And now um, we've kind of created our own problem because the, the, the channelized section is so limited that with climate change coming, what was seen as a flood conveyance benefit is now a liability for us. So uh, there was a lot of interest in taking on river restoration projects that would increase the, our flood con uh, our ability to manage higher flood flows given that we can't really manage them in the lakes anymore. Next slide. The fish species that have been particularly impacted, we have three um, uh, salmon species, uh, anadromously coming back from the ocean, uh, sockeye salmon. We have a, a fabulous sockeye rebound um, uh, rebounding population right now. Uh, Chinook, though, still remain rare, and we have both a spring and fall Chinook uh, stock. Steelhead also occur and are quite rare. Coho have been extirpated, as well as lamprey from the valley. So these are all Columbia River fish, and they represent now, the Okanagan sockeye represents 80% of the total Columbia River run. So we have a lot to protect here uh, and take care of. We also have resident uh, salmon species such as kokanee and rainbow trout. Next slide. And then to make it even more difficult for these indigenous fish species, uh, we have 13 exotic fish species uh, that you can see in that uh, long list that have been introduced um, pretty much since the late 1800s. Uh, fish like the largemouth bass are very pacivorous ambush predators. They do not do as well in a natural river as they do in a channelized river, particularly when you've created impoundments where you had to slow the river due to those drop structures. Uh, and Eurasian milfoil then, uh, we've completely changed this ecosystem. So Eurasian milfoil, also an invasive species, has really taken hold and um, uh, and, and just covers the entire, the entire channelized section is covered with Eurasian milfoil pretty much. And these bass can then hang out in these Eurasian milfoil and as our, the sockeye fry are migrating down to their lake habitat, they kind of are dim sum for these bass that just sort of pop out and kind of grab these, uh, uh, can grab these fish on their way. So we've created fabulous habitat for these uh, invasive uh, fish species. 
and which just adds even more difficulty to, to the, the, the local fish species here. Next slide. So that really gives sort of a picture of what kind of went wrong um, and the fact that we got it wrong. We were assuming that the question at the time um, uh, during sort of colonization and urban development was really about how do we move water from A and B to benefit our own needs for irrigation, to be able to grab more land, uh, to have land close to water so that we can um, do farming. But we kind of missed the point of what maybe the question should have been, which may have been, how do we take care of this river and how do we take care of this fish and what is our responsibility to that? So the late Chief Albert Saddleman uh, spoke for on a nation level uh, on a, quite a few committees all the way from the 40s on, and he had a very strong vision that is nationwide supported to put the river back to where it was and put the fish back into their natural distribution. And this was sort of the beginning of this traditional ecological knowledge information that we um, that we started using. There is, of course, now layers and layers of traditional ecological knowledge, depending on the project and the site, that have been incorporated into these um, new questions, which are not about how do we make the best trails, how do we make uh, it easier for people to take water for irrigation, but how do we maintain a responsibility to these waterways and the species that rely on them that maybe isn't as human centric. Next slide. So a lot of the discussion, this is sort of a classic sort of for food chief, which is a central chapter uh, story of the Okanagan uh, peoples, um, which does talk to how we have to really consider everything as being very interconnected and that we have to put ourselves back into this space in a good way and not as users of this space, but caretakers of the space. Next slide. This really should be driving our objectives as we, and the questions that we may move forward. And I'm gonna, gonna hark on this a little bit because whatever is your objective and your question really is gonna drive how you monitor and how you learn from that moving forward. So this, between the Albert Settlement vision, identifying that we have a liability issue now with these very controlled flows, very controlled um, river spaces, for, gave birth to the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative, which started uh, in uh, 1999, 98. And there was, has been a series of projects. And depending on how I count them, um, there's somewhere between 11 and 15 projects that have occurred over just the past uh, 20 years. It took us 10 years to do the first project uh, on the Okanagan River. And it was a very long period of trying to figure out the design and where do we start and what do we, what do, we do and then how do we learn from it. The next project occurred in about three years. And after that, it, the pro these projects have been turning around in about a year and a half um, is, is our average. Uh, next slide. So part of the reason that there has been sort of this improvement is that we started off with the, this uh, Okanagan River Restoration Initiative's steering committee, which is a very collaborative, very broad-based knowledge group. They're, what they're doing is really based on just traditional ecological information that they get in terms of guidance to make a river restoration not a project, but an initiative. And that initiative does, occurs in space and in time. So in space, it wasn't just about just this, this um, one little 100 meter section, but we had to really think about the entire river. They also, the knowledge keepers that inform these traditional ecological knowledge guidance pieces are constantly reminding us that we have to think about everything from the snowpack to the Okanagan River to how it then flows out into the Okanagan, uh, into the lower Columbia system as well, and really consider ourselves in uh, space. The other element is to consider an initiative in terms of time. And again, this all impacts how we have monitored and uh, how we've learned and moved monitoring the information forward. So to consider it in a space of time as an initiative, it, it's again, it's not a project. So we've never been meant to 
hit it and quit it. Um, all of the objectives here of this Okanagan River Restoration Initiative to increase flood capacity, reconnect floodplains, improve water quality, create more complexity, that is, is not just to fix it, but to maintain a level of responsibility and care of this river in the long term. So to maybe look at this channelization as just a blip in time that was a, a bit of an issue, and then how are we going to learn and move forward uh, in terms of care and responsibility of this uh, space so that we always kind of maintain that care and responsibility. And this is very kind of core to a lot of the Okanagan Nation's uh, beliefs as they had a very strong resource management system prior to colonization. They want that kind of reestablish that sense of care and responsibility for uh, waterways, their ecosystems that connect to those waterways, and the fish and the species that rely on those waterways. Next slide. So this, we really wanted to go from this very simple channelized dike system to a very diverse one. Next slide. And this very collaborative, very broad-based knowledge group of people, as you can see just by the number of um, icons there, it's a very large group. Um, they have been turning around projects in a year and a half. And part of the reason they've been turning those projects around within this initiative in a year and a half is relates to the fact that they are fed very solid monitoring data. So they understand what is in front of them in terms of what the issues are, what we've learned from the last project and how to move forward. So the committee itself has been together for over 20 years. There's three people that kind of are consistent over the 20 years. And there's a lot of new people that have come into the steering committee, but they've been able to sort of maintain a connection and this sense of learning from the monitoring that uh, has occurred and the projects and how we've um, uh, dealt with the, the projects. The devils are always in the details. Uh, next slide. So this group is very effective, again, because of this tech guidance. Uh, the tech guidance really doesn't ask us to do anything um, crazy outside of the box of, let's just put the river back, put the complexity, put the interconnectedness, and put the rate of change back. And I kind of want to hark in terms, again, back to monitoring, to consider what a tech meeting can very easily go into a discussion about. And it's always about relationships, diversity, and rates of change. So a tech group will talk about relationships in terms of a river project of how a cottonwood, for example, has a very strong relationship to a juvenile Chinook salmon. And then we have seen in the science how those two species really do actually rely on each other in certain stages of the uh, of their life stages of, of their life cycles. So understanding how a river, which is really just the tip of an iceberg, because the river is actually the entire groundwater system, as well as what's coming upstream and how it's connected downstream. So to see all of these relationships that this river has with its world is something that the tech guidance is kind of amazing at being able to um, uh, identify and make sure that we're considering when we're trying to look at that 100 meter stretch of river uh, and deal with a particular uh, issue related to this larger initiative of restoring the river system. It also looks at, uh, it can easily cut, get into discussions about the diversity, the amount of diversity they remember seeing. So instead of looking to see something that you want, like I want to see um, controlled flows and no bank erosion, they can kind of look at them and be like, well, what you want to see is pool riffle combinations. And we want to see a ratio of pool riffle combinations as an example. And then we go in and then we can monitor what, okay, well, what is the ratio of pool riffle uh, combinations that we're trying to restore to and how well does does that get maintained as rivers, which the third item have a rate of change. Elders can also easily start talking about what is a normal rate of change and what is an abnormal rate of change. And what they see in a natural river, often they'll talk about is these normal rates of change, how they kind of move from one section to another or one channel maybe to another how they engage and disengage with their side channels, how they change over a year, 
how they change over five, 10, 50 years. They can easily get into that discussion and provide that guidance. And then that is something for us to follow up on in terms of monitoring for a long-term status and trend style monitoring to make sure that those um, types of connections are occurring. They also can easily flip in. Uh, so those are the, the three that also easily for rates of change, they can look at a channelized river that is eroding at its bank. I mean, like, well, that there's a there's something wackadoodle going on here. If it's eroding in this particular site, we, we need to kind of look upstream and downstream and see what is going on. So they can easily see those things that I think we miss. And a lot of the monitoring, because it's we're an indigenous organization, uh, and we are quite strongly connected to our uh, traditional ecological knowledge groups, really rely quite heavily on looking at the rivers um, the way they see them in terms of then monitoring to see effectiveness of some of these um, restoration projects. So on top of that, we have this 20 years of monitoring data and the that's made this group very, very effective in making decisions, this Okanagan River Restoration Initiative Steering Committee. And in that 20 years, at the very, very beginning of the 20 years, we made this huge poster of all of the monitoring that we wanted to kind of do related to what we're being told we need to try and find a way to fix in a long term, large space uh, initiative. And yeah, it took up part of the greater part of a wall. Uh, it was obviously overbuilt, but we did that to try to go through the process of identifying how to prioritize then what was important and what was the questions we needed to answer right away um, and what were the questions we might need to answer later. It was also very helpful because people don't, or funding groups don't typically like to fund monitoring. So then it was easier for us to see this big picture of the monitoring and identify, right, if you only had 5,000 a year, what would we chunk off this year so that we didn't try and do it all, but we learned, okay, so if you're doing a sediment transport, you're trying to understand how gravel is moving, how gravel bars are setting up and shifting, then we need to do that once every five years. But maybe we need, because of the variance in data, we need snorkel surveys every year. So we were able to kind of have that very fruitful, very quick discussion on what we wanted to monitor for, depending on what kind of funds we had. Because we had this large scale plan, monitoring plan, and because we're this large scale initiative, restoration initiative, we've also been able to uh, seize opportunities. So master's students, honors students with PhDs have all kind of checked in at some, we've had somebody check in at some point, been like, hey, I'd like to study something related to this. And then we can fit their thesis into some of the questions that we need to answer. So that has been really helpful. And all of this has created this very fast turnaround so that by the time we get to the next project, we're learning from the first project and we're applying it to the next project. Next slide. So the monitoring data uh, and adaptations that I kind of want to focus on for the rest of the presentation here um, are some of the key pieces that we've uh, learned from. One is sediment transport and how rivers, because rivers are meant to be conveyor belts of their stuff, and they have a certain amount of energy to do that. And that level of energy they have decides on where those sediments either land or uh, uh, erode, degrade, or aggrade. And that moves uh, materials around, and that impacts heavily into where uh, water weeds are, like invasive uh, milfoil and spawning areas. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to talk about some of the boulder clusters that we originally tried to uh, install in some of our projects, as well as kind of not overlapping, but kind of talking about how the rivers connect with their floodplains. So not overlapping with Casey's too much, but definitely complementing these ideas of how planting works most effectively and what our Chinook rearing habitat looks like. Next slide. So again, we had this very broad based monitoring plan that included both stream channel response, uh, hydrologic responses, biological responses, as well as terrestrial responses in terms of riparian and terrestrial species um, uh, corridors or terrestrial um, responses. Next slide. And we kind of, in this monitoring plan, we split things off into a couple of pieces. We had a number of monitoring topics that related to adaptive management. 
So sometimes we measure things specifically because we wanted to understand if they worked and if we should do them ever again or if we should alter how we did them. So we had a series of monitoring styles to uh, answer those questions because, again, this was an initiative. So we weren't just supposed to do a project and walk away. We had to kind of keep it going kind of as long as we possibly as you know, until things got fixed, but then even, even past that in terms of managing and maintaining uh, healthy river ecosystems. Next. The second monitoring type was really effectiveness monitoring. And this um, we also sort of call ass covering monitoring. So there was a few things that were important for us to monitor so that when we had questions of or misunderstandings come up that we had the data to be able to show, no, we didn't create flooding in your property. The water levels before and after um, have been maintained the same based on these cross sections or where these water level loggers are located. So we always had also this element done in the short term. So adaptive management monitoring was often quite short term, was just to learn from those, um, uh, a setback or learn from a riffle building and then figure out how we can best apply to the next project. This one was also very short term. We just needed to cover certain, a, a certain range of variability. So sometimes we needed to cover in effectiveness monitoring a range of flows and a, a range of temperatures, uh, a range of seasons. And then we could kind of answer the questions we needed, package that up and be ready to kind of answer questions uh, in terms of issues that people may have perceived but um we didn't we wanted to again as an initiative we wanted to make this um as uh, we wanted to be able to answer those questions so you wouldn't get spiral into some confusion of oh i think they've uh they've done this restoration and now they they have to ha have this discharge at a certain level or um this area next to my house is never flooded before and now it, it has water which those are often not totally true based on people's perceptions because people, even in this space, stay very short term. They'll come to community meetings with on the last, I've witnessed the, the damage of my front yard and, and how is that? It's, well, in the last five years, it's flooded. I'm like, well, that's because there's been a flood in the last five years. That has nothing to do with a monitoring, pro like a restoration project, that's actually just the ecosystem that you live in. So it was really kind of important to be able to answer those questions to maintain the space for this initiative to be able to move forward positively. Next slide. The last monitoring method was status and trend monitoring. So a lot of this is a lot more related to the biology because fish don't really return. Um, you don't see a jump up of fish in. Uh, months or days. This occurs over long periods of time. And so a lot of the status and trend monitoring uh, related to the riparian regrowth and uh, the fish returning. Next. So some of our main results, I'm going to start off with natural sediment transport processes. So in the Oliver's uh, restoration project, one of the first ones we took on, we re-meandered rivers, we added riffles, we added spawning beds, and we were measuring how much is a ratio between pools and riffle habitats that existed and how much spawning areas existed and uh, the types of spawning, uh, the quality of the spawning area, the size of the gravel, that types of thing. So those items were monitored to sort of understand what the rate of change was going to be in this space and did we dial the energy of the restoration in properly? So is this river able to move the material it needs to, to maintain the habitat that we understood was supposed to be here, which was spawning areas and rearing areas for trout. So pools and spawning beds. Uh, next slide. Um, and what we found was that it actually, it was very, very successful. And so we, we were monitoring to answer that Question. Again, it's always monitoring to a question or an objective. So, you, so spending the time on identifying these objectives and these questions are really, really important. The, quest the issue we had was a lack of spawning areas and a lack of pool habitat. And what we found in this particular reach, because it is connected to some form of sediment transport, 
within the river, that new gravels were coming down in uh, floods, and they were redistributing. But in these particular situations, the total amount of spawning area and the total amount of pools continued to exist. However, they would shift every flood or every two floods. The main driving force for the energy of a river relates to its two-year flood discharge frequency. So as long as you have that dialed in, you could potentially maintain um, these spaces even though the spaces shift. So that was something we really wanted to understand. We wanted to understand if, if we could prove that and if we could make that happen. And, uh, and also that when these gravels move around, the egg incubation survivals are improved. So we were seeing those uh, in terms of our monitoring results. The other thing that we saw very starkly was the photo that you're looking at with all of with the re the reconnected meander. So that was cut off. The island in the middle was actually the dike. That was probably 80% covered by Eurasian uh, exotic milfoil. And we never actually dug it up or removed it. And again, because we had this massive monitoring plan, we were very lucky in the fact that the um, space, um, uh, oh, when we were monitoring other elements and we had just enough time, we happened to have one of our fisheries biologists that was amazing, or that was really good at identifying macrophytes. So then she spent an afternoon. Uh, anyway, should we add, we were kind of able to impromptu add a macrophyte assessment, even though it, it was in the plan, but it wasn't funded. People weren't really interested in funding that at the time. However, the um, during creating this project and then waiting for a two-year flood to occur a couple of intervals, the Eurasian milfoil is at zero. There's not one Eurasian milfoil in this restored reach that remains. And the diversity of the native macrophytes have increased, even though they only ever have been sort of a two to five percent coverage of the bed area. And they don't provide the same uh, habitat for largemouth bass as did the Eurasian milfoil. So that was like this big surprise for us that we didn't realize we could even do that. But because we could start seeing it, uh, these uh, milfoil beds go away, then we were putting more effort towards measuring that to identify and monitor how that, how that works. Next slide. So we have a kind of a very different uh, problem in Penticton Channel. So um, Penticton Channel has uh, spawning beds that had to be created because the entire section of the river was obliterated for spawning fish in the 1950s. And we had fish now moving into salmon moving in because we've removed some barriers and we needed to create some spawning beds. So we have a really different issue here where these spawning beds are very, very stable and there's no inputs of new gravel and the gravel isn't really able to shift. Next slide. And so now our monitoring is really focusing on these beds to identify how fast Eurasian milfoil kind of recolonizes spawning beds now that this gravel isn't really moving, how that impacts egg incubation success in uh, some of these areas. Um, and for all of you fish biologist nerds, that bottom picture, the little clear spots are all the reds on a brand new built um, spawning area. There's these fish, um, we're constantly learning how much smarter they are than us as well. It's very humbling because they, there's a, you know, the, by the time we were building gravel bed four in 2019 compared to gravel bed one in 2014, uh, I can pick up the two pieces of gravel from each of them and they look identical to me in any way that I can monitor them. <laughs> and yet I know that the gravel in the um, latest bed is is placed newer. It's just recently placed gravel, so it's fresher gravel. And fish will always go to the fresher gravel first. I, I don't understand it, but even after a freshet, when the gravel beds move and shift, what we show up and we're like, hey, this used to be a pool here. This is so neat. Now it's a, it looks like it could be a spawning bed, and the fish will find those. So there's these fish, there's an element of monitoring where our observation is limited, 
by our humanness and we don't see necessarily what they see or what they feel in terms of how they're selecting and what's going to make them make um, preferred habitat than selected. Because a selected habitat is always going to be a combination of uh, preferred and what is available to them. And just by giving them what's available and monitoring that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that is the most effective monitoring that you, or most effective restoration that you could create. So we are constantly being challenged to think through that dynamic to make sure that we're as representative to these fish needs and we're providing um, preferred areas as well as uh, available areas. Next slide. So we have a long plan ahead to try and get on, on top of what um, could be, and we have a lot of monitoring coming up when we are trying to build spawning areas and what is too stable a system when we don't actually have the energy dialed in because we're really limited uh, by dams up at the, the, the top of the reach as well as uh, the confinement because we weren't really able to um, widen the area and reestablish that. Next slide. So the next one I'm going to talk about really quickly is habitat features. So boulders here we identified or were lost um, when the river was channelized and straightened. And so we put in a couple of boulders in the, uh, well, we put in a lot of boulders, actually. And as you can see in one of the photos with one of the red um, circles that the, the excavator, no matter how many times we asked him to make it more natural, he, he naturally put them in a straight line. Uh, and it was, um, it was interesting, but when we put the, these boulder clusters and they were angular boulders placed really snugly together and they were placed on a gravel bed, our tech community was like, I don't think it's going to work. And the biologists were like, no, we really need this type of habitat feature. Uh, and what happened was these boulders, because they were so tight together, um, the water in the flood period would kind of go over the boulder dig a hole in the gravel and then bury the uh, the boulder. So we have lost all the habitat features related uh, to these boulders. Next slide. And again, based on rates of change and relationships of water to boulders, the tech community was like, no, you need to build them differently. They need to kind of protect each other. So to think about these boulders um, all being protected by their uh, their goose or their flying south V cousins, uh, where the boulder at the very top end that is taking the brunt of the flow is then being protected from scour by two behind. And all of that is allowing a lot of diversity of little bits of flow going back, eddying, slowing down, the water going over the rocks to create invertebrate habitats. And this uh, diversity of habitats that you can create by doing building boulder clusters um, differently. Next slide. So now I'm going to transition to uh, floodplains and uh, the terrestrial response. And the uh, we have identified earlier, and Casey had mentioned it well, how cut off floodplains were. The idea was just to move the water from, that was the question, how can you move water from A to B? And again, our questions now are different. How do you improve flood capacity and how do you maintain diversity and positive rates of change? So floodplains are, we have a lot of ephemeral floodplain habitat according to our um, uh, elders and knowledge guidance. And these would only be inundated at high flows. The guidance for us was also that there was a very strong bond or connection between cottonwood ecosystems and Chinook juvenile rearing ecosystems, and they wanted to see that uh, reestablished. And so we um, connected a number. We removed, so we had some setback dike projects. We've also had some dike cut projects, which allowed for flooding in a controlled uh, way. A lot of these uh, in our first six years, we spent a lot of time planting them. And then we had to replant them and then water them. And we just were really struggling with um, getting these riparian areas to take. And going back to the, um, the tech, they said, well, it looks like you just you got it wrong in the fact that it, 
you don't actually have an ephemeral floodplain. It's not it's not connected high enough. Like the river had been channelized, so we'd actually lost some space. And so now how the river interacts with the floodplain is a little um, off kilter. And a lot of river modeling and water level logger uh, monitoring data later, we identified where that cutoff was and what was out of whack. And it wasn't fitting with this Q2 um, water level. And the minute we had gotten, we had made different cuts and we adjusted even between the dike setback. So sometimes a dike setback is just not enough. You need to, it's the space um, between the, this new dike and the river, that energy of how that connects to the river at a two-year flood flow is really going to drive what that ecosystem looks like. So for six years, we planted uh, we had a lot of losses. It was quite depressing. Um, and when we finally gave our head a shake and realized, well, we had gotten it wrong. Um, and what we needed is to readjust how the river connected with the floodplain, which sometimes meant cutting it down in spaces. Then we didn't plant anything. After that, it grew on its own. And it was the cheapest planting project uh, ever, which was awesome. It's also created these thickets and the successional plant stages that have allowed a the yellow-breasted chat, which is a species at risk, um, and great basin uh, spadefoot toads to flourish. So much so that we were being compared to reference sites, and now these some of these restoration areas actually exceed the population abundances of the reference sites. So you kind of know you've got it right when the animals tell you you've got it right, not when you think you've got it right. Uh, next slide. So some of these reconnections uh, is when you uh, do this dike setback. And then if you connect the water to the river and you dial in that energy, you will they will just grow on its own. So this, the two after photos was directly after construction. And then after a year, I think it was only just a year or two later and very little planting. And it just, it took, um, it took on its own. So when you get it right, the ecosystem takes care uh, of itself. And this is what we really rely on this tech guidance um, to help us through. Next slide. So in uh, another ecosystem connection uh, in down in Okanagan River uh, is was just showing again how we thought we had it dialed in when we see the dike set back on the bottom part of the photo with the blue areas we thought were quite low and should be inundated with water. These are the areas we're trying to plant. Nothing is taking. And we had to recut. It turns out the engineer, um, even though we asked for that to be connected at a two-year flow, when we, we monitored it, we identified that it wasn't. A two-year flow is 57 cubic meters per second, but these weren't getting inundated until 85 cubic meters per second which is quite high and fairly infrequent for us. So we um, were able to kind of adaptively manage this project and go back in and make a few minor cuts that made big differences to um, how the ecosystem and these plant communities responded. Next. Uh, this is, I think Casey's there in the foreground planting some trees uh, and then sort of what it looks like uh, after. Um, with these cottonwood meadows that are sort of reconnected so that fish can access them, but also not get stranded and they always uh, drain back into the river. Next slide. And another floodplain reconnection project, but now the problem or the question in front of us was how do you reconnect a side channel? And we had identified that we, we that there's a, not enough side channels and we kind of would, it'd be great if we could get a side channel project. So we built a side channel with an approach channel, which you can kind of see in the gravel, kind of starkly in the bottom left side. And this approach channel was meant to bring water into the side channel at all years. Our monitoring did show that we were creating actually spaces of anoxic conditions and very, very high unsuitable temperatures were occurring in these side, this particular side channel in which case it wasn't really functioning as a refugia for anything more than high flows. And what we really needed as we were kind of trying to monitor our Chinook populations here was Chinook to kind of come into some of these spaces, um, especially fall Chinook, to rear in these side channel or off channel habitats for only like four to six weeks, get well connected to their friends, the cottonwood, 
and then leave nice and early so that they can be out and down through the Columbia before any thermal barriers set up for them there. So we wanted to dial this one in terms of the energy of having, we wanted to get them out. So we realized that it wasn't really working having an all year round side channel. A better habitat type would be to have an ephemeral side channel. So where it's only connected for uh, this sort of six week period in the spring. Next slide. We also had a couple of issues, even though the side channel was functioning amazingly as a water quality refugia in the spring, it was not a water quality refugia in the, in the summer periods. We have a very hot, dry ecosystem here. And we had a lot of issue with gravel deposition in front of the, uh, within the channel. And our monitoring data then feeding back to the committee was saying, well, we need to change this. Now we, need, we know we need to get it away from being a permanent side channel and adaptively manage it into an ephemeral side channel because this is what these fish are needing and this is what this ecosystem is kind of needing from us. And it's also going to be easier for us to maintain. I, my plug, and I ha probably have several of them uh, for traditional ecological knowledge, is that the projects that we have that follow more with it, that have the richest uh, tech or elders knowledge components are always the ones that are the most long-term stable. Um, we rarely have to go back too many more times to fix it or adaptively manage it. There, there's just, it's been very solid uh, guidance. Um, anyway, so there's my soapbox. All right, next slide. <laughs> Uh, so this is us. We're measuring the conditions in this side channel. Uh, and this, again, is a river, river restoration initiative, not just a project. We've been really beneficial to have time and have people stay on the land and on the space and keep an eye on these, um, uh, keep an eye on these projects. So this is when we are really monitoring the water temperatures, the dissolved oxygen, and how that relates to the, the river discharges. Next slide. And then we found a sweet spot where there's a space right exactly where the, um, the Chinook fry would be emerging and needing ephemeral side channel spaces or ephemeral floodplain spaces um, and what flows that would be, what an average flow uh, would be for that. That's the, the orange band. And then we just made sure that that channel would be accessible um, at those flows. Next slide. Um, so again, these Chinook, uh, they need to get in there. They need to eat very, very quickly, grow, which gives them more success in getting down the, the upper Columbia and out to the river. So when feeding success is greater in these floodplain areas, they grow bigger and they're more healthy and successful fish to return. Next slide. So we took this approach channel and we made it into a gravel bar and we set the elevations of the gravel bar and the access to the channel related to what we were measuring in terms of the flows and how the discharge created a water level that would then engage this uh, side channel area in the time frame that May, June that we were really uh, hoping for. Next slide. So this is what it looked like before, and this is what it looks like after. Now as a side, as a gravel bar, it's still a little bit underwater there. Um, flows are a bit high at that time, but uh, now we're kind of excited to continue to monitor and stay in this, uh, stay on this uh, project to see how uh, effective it is for managing uh, sediment deposition as well as Chinook use. Next slide. So. My plug is that some, that monitoring, even if it's small, that is well planned and exists over a long term um, period, which really is an indigenous, this is where you're in the indigenous nations and the indigenous population is the biggest benefit to restoration projects is not only that have they witnessed it for thousands and thousands of years, but indigenous populations typically stay put in their space and they're better able to keep an eye on restoration and management maintenance projects. They're a better monitor uh, to 
un- to sort of see how things are progressing and learn from them and, you know, keep moving these projects forward. Uh, so again, that's my, my plug, I guess, on uh, restoration and how uh, the sort of nations can be a massive benefit to your project. And just if you are interested in that type of work, um, be patient because as colonizers, we did a lot to destroy those relationships and rebuilding is real and it will happen. It'll be fine. It'll just take some time uh, to find the right people and to get them in place. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Carrie. That that was a wonderful talk. I, I've seen you give versions of that uh, a couple of times. Um, I'm going to pose a question to you, but I ask you just to hold it and maybe address it when we come to the panel discussion. But I'll, I'll give it to you now so you can take it away. Uh, and, and it kind of builds off a question that's coming from our Slido. Uh, and, and in particular, thinking about monitoring of habitat and habitat restoration projects. Uh, and with respect to the consideration and, and the, the, um, the driving force of Indigenous knowledge in the work that uh, you've been doing. Uh, I, I, it would be interesting for me to hear from you how uh, factoring in uh, traditional knowledge or Indigenous knowledge uh, might be different in terms of your monitoring plan and your monitoring objectives than it would be if you only looked at a Western science view. Because we spent a lot of time this morning focusing on you know, the, the Western science view of monitoring. And, and I'd like to kind of explore that dimension uh, with you uh, when we come to panel.